Secret. All right, my name is Jack Bush. I uh, work for Texas A&M AgriLife Research. I'm a research associate there, and today I'd like to share with you uh, our study on dust abatement potential. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, thanks for sticking around for this long and this late in the day. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, I'm sure most of y'all know know about the uh, problems with feed yard dust, but uh, <coughs> mostly uh, there's a associated odor with it. It can be a traffic hazard, and it can also be a health hazard for uh, some people who are really sensitive to it and have asthma and stuff like that. But mainly it's just really a nuisance, uh, especially for neighbors that live close to the feed yard and uh, for feed yard employees and for the scientists that spend all their time downwind of a feed yard. <coughs> um, feed yard managers have a lot of uh, different dust abatement measures that you can choose from to help reduce the dust. Uh, manure harvesting is one of the one of the big ones, uh, mainly just going out and uh, scraping up all of the manure and getting rid of it. There's also chemical amendments such as adding oils and resins and uh, there has been some experimentation with feed management both in feed timing and with feeding the animals different feeds to uh, increase the, the amount of fats that are excreted to help add to the oil composition of the, the manure. And finally, uh, water application, uh, both active and passive. Mainly the active is with sprinklers and water trucks, but that can be really expensive. Uh, so what <clears throat> we were looking at was to uh, see if we could adjust the stocking density to basically add moisture to the feedlot surface by increasing the amount of cattle and increasing the amount of uh, excretions they put on the ground, keeping the ground wet and helping to make it pack down better. <clears throat> so first of all, we found uh, a feed yard that was willing to let us come out there and, and do this. And they gave us two sets of uh, 20 pens that were laid out on the southwest corner of the feed yard. Uh, and what we did was we blocked all the pens. We basically cut it in half and one side was our control pen where we left the stocking density at the normal rate of 150 square feet per head. And then on the other half we doubled the stocking density and we did that in two different ways and one half of that treatment area we called treatment one and we uh, put in cross fencing and just made the pen half the size of normal and kept the normal amount of cattle in there and for treatment two, we just doubled the number of cattle in each one. <clears throat> so this is a quick aerial photo of, of what I'm talking about. The, the brown on the right is the control. This is our control treatment group. Treatment one is in the blue, where we put in the cross fencing. There's still the same number of cattle, but the area of the pens is half the size. And then in the green, we put twice as many cattle in. All right, for our PM10 sampling, uh, we tried to find, or we're trying to come up with a good way to measure the downwind and upwind PM10 uh, from each treatment group. The way we normally do it is with uh, things like T-OMs and FRMs where uh, they're big and bulky and expensive and then they only give you one, give you a measurement from one single point as opposed to across the whole treatment group. So our idea was to come up with a, a mobile sampling platform where we put some fairly inexpensive uh, particle measures, measuring devices from uh, TSI Incorporated on a mobile sampling platform and drove them really slow across uh, the downwind and upwind side in order to get sort of a pseudo path averaged uh, downwind dust concentration. And for each one, we set the uh, sampler inlet at 22 inches above the ground and uh, 
co-located a GPS receiver along with each one so that we knew exactly where the sampler was when it took each sample. And uh, we kind of <clears throat> fabricated a small cruise control for each, uh, each four-wheeler to limit the speed to around one to one and a half miles an hour. This is just a quick look at the uh, first <clears throat> four-wheeler. Uh, it's just an ATV that we added the particle sizer and uh, the OPS and GPS receiver on. <clears throat> and the feed yard that we were working at was nice enough to lend us another machine uh, that we put the uh, dust track two on and uh, set it up to where the inlet was 22 inches above the ground, just like on the four-wheeler. This is just a quick shot of which, uh, of where each one was driven for each uh, sampling set. We started on the uh, west side and for the OPS on the, the ATV, we started <clears throat> in, the, in between the J row and the K row of pins and drove it down the uh, working alley in order to measure the uh, downwind dust concentrations from the J pins themselves. And <clears throat> each loop took about 30 minutes. We'd drive 15 minutes on the downwind side and then hurry up to the south side and then do another 15 minutes down the south to get upwind concentrations. And luckily the uh, feed yard was nice enough to lend us a pretty steady stream of interns and student workers to do the the job of driving those four-wheelers super slow in the uh, dustiest part of the day. <clears throat> we had several criteria for when we actually did sample. Uh, obviously, we had to have southerly winds in order for the, the north side to be the downwind side. And uh, we tried to keep it during fairly calm to moderate wind speeds so that, uh, <clears throat> you know, we didn't want it dead calm where the plume wasn't going the direction we wanted it, but we also didn't want the wind howling through there and uh, scouring the surface. And obviously it also had to be dry. We didn't sample right after it rained because we didn't measure any dust. And uh, we also only did it late in the evening during the peak where, uh, <clears throat> where usually the dust concentrations are highest. It's right when when the sun's going down and the cattle start getting up and moving around and they kick up a lot more dust. And that's usually when the evening inversion sets up to where the, the upper level of the atmosphere, the boundary layer comes down and really concentrates the dust. And we also, during the whole, the whole sampling time, we had a uh, weather station set up from Campbell Scientific that we used to measure all the, the local weather. <clears throat> In addition to uh, measuring the weather and the PM10 concentrations, uh, we dispersion modeling in order to estimate the emission flux of the PM10 from, uh, from the feed yard surface. Uh, we really didn't have a, a viable way of actually measuring the flux off of the surface, uh, so we used uh, dispersion model air model in order to estimate that and uh, we take all of our weather and location and everything and give air mod an emission flux and then it spits out a downwind concentration and then we scale that to the concentrations we actually measured in order to estimate what the, the emission flux would have been while we were there. In addition to that, while we were there, we uh, had anybody that went out there to check on equipment or the time we went out there to sample, we took a pen surface assessment. Uh, we just had a sheet where you could run through real quick and uh, basically write down what, what each pen surface looked like according to these uh, seven criteria, which ranged, for, ranged from... Uh, the surface that would be the least likely to produce dust to the surface that would be most likely to, to produce dust. Uh, just a quick picture of what that looks like. This would be what we call a B 
which would uh, <clears throat> is mostly, you know, most of the ground is really compact and really hard like concrete and there's very little uh, manure on top of that that is loose and so it's very unlikely to produce very much dust. Uh, this is what we'd call a C. It's kind of the middle of the road where there's still a lot of uh, really hard and compact manure, but uh, they're starting to get a buildup of the loose manure on top of the surface. And this is what we call an E. That would be one of the most likely to produce a lot of dust because the <clears throat> all of the manure on the surface is really dry and packed loose and pretty deep so that it produces a lot of dust. Uh, this is just a quick look at, uh, at one of the loops that we did with the OPS just to get an idea of what it looked like. Uh, you can see the different concentrations downwind of each treatment group. In terms of uh, PM10 uh, this is the overall average for all the loops that we did and we split it up between what we measured with the OPS downwind and with the dust track that was downwind of the K row which uh, would involve bulk J and K rows you know producing the dust and as you can see the control groups for each one were both the average concentration was much higher in the control than it was in either treatment group. Uh, treatment one for the J row is really low, but uh, <clears throat> just the difference in the pin surface would not uh, account for that because the the pin on that row, if you remember, was actually uh, half the size, so it's going to put out less dust and it was also further away from where we were sampling because it had to be on the south side uh, where the feed bunk was and uh, in the K downwind of the K row we were actually able to measure you know right next to the to that pin so they're a little bit more a little bit closer there in terms of emission flux uh, kind of the same same way, the control group was much higher than both treatment groups. Uh, and J row, it was pretty much right at half. Uh, the emission flux was about half of what the control was. And it was even lower once we got downwind to the K row. And the same thing with our calculated emission factor in kilograms per thousand head per day. Uh, you can see the control group was was much, much higher than both the treatment groups. But we kind of got to be careful about looking at this as the, you know, it's, it's reported in kilograms per thousand head per day, but that is <clears throat> at the maximum emission flux of the day so there's only about an hour or two during the day where you're actually emitting that much you know the rest of the day it's much much lower we took all this data and uh, ran it through SPSS and did an analysis of variance on there and uh, in terms of concentration uh, for the J row it was a significant difference between uh, the control and treatment groups, but for some reason uh, there was not a significant difference in emission flux. And but <clears throat> downwind of the K row, there was a significant difference both in terms of concentration and emission flux. And in the post hoc test, uh, you can see. You know, there were no significant differences in emission flux for J row, but uh, downwind of K and J row, uh, it's kind of what we what we expected. There was a significant difference in terms of both concentration and flux between the control and treatment groups, but there was no difference between the two treatment groups. So basically, no matter how you arrive at double stocking density, it's basically the same. And 
and I took all the uh, corral surface assessments and uh, compiled them all together into a database and this just shows uh, basically I took the total number of times each uh, pin score was used and uh, took an average of or a percentage of times uh, that score was used in a control pin or in a double stock pin and as you can see um, for the A's and B's, the, the side with the least dust potential, uh, they were most often scored for the double stock pins, and control pins were most often scored uh, E or an F, with much higher potential for, dust, for creating dust. This is just a quick shot from one of the guys that was running the four-wheeler on the uh, in the working alley between the J and K pins. Uh, the J row is on the right and K pin is on the left. And uh, you can see the, the dust plume down there and that lines up exactly in the middle where the, the uh, double stock pins where he is at taking the picture coming into the control pins over there. So you can actually, in the photo, you can see the difference of dust blowing from the control pins and uh, treatment pens. So <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, at least looking at the J and K pens together, uh, there appeared to be pretty good reduction in, in emission flux and emission factor in PM10. Uh, <clears throat> we mainly the PM10 is reduced mainly by uh, both compacting the manure and increasing the moisture content. Uh, by having more cattle, uh, excreting manure and urine on it keeps it wet. More, more cattle stomping on it, keeping it packed down, and uh, probably more uh, shading due to, you know, there's always a cow standing there and it's always in the shade, so you don't have the sun, sun drying it out quite as often. And I'd like to thank the uh, cooperating feed yard for uh, providing the, the area to do the sampling and for the uh, personnel to do the sampling for us. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes? Uh, the uh, feed yard is keeping that to themselves, uh, so I don't know, but my, my education educated guess is that yeah there's probably a, they probably took a pretty good hit for the the double stocked so uh that's kind of the next the next step at this this was the first you know a first shot at it where we just tried to maximize the signal by doubling the stocking density and only measuring during the dustiest part of the day just to see if we could you know uh <clears throat> I would think that they didn't do as good because there is not as much room at the uh, feed bunks. I mean, you've got the same amount of room, but you have twice as many cattle trying to get in there. Well, the feed bunk was the same, but uh, so in the in the pen that we just cut the uh, pen size in half, you still had the same bunk space per cow. But in the double stocked where we put twice as many cattle in there, we that basically cut the bunk space in half. And in and, and those pens, you could see that, you know, the bunk would be completely packed like this, and then there's still lots of cattle back there waiting to eat. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if they took a hickey or not, but my guess is that, the, that there was probably a decrease in performance.